Good morning, everybody, and welcome to The Balancing Act. We're having a good time. I'm Julie Moran. And I'm Olga Villaverde. Today, we're going to learn more about PNH. It's a deadly, life-threatening disease with devastating consequences. It's a rare blood disorder that affects, Julie, five patients per million, but its rarity doesn't make it any less significant. Wow. Plus, do you have a teenager ready to head to college? Oh, goodness. I mean, I still have a few years. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> but parents, <laughs> listen up. We're on location at the University of Oregon's Week of welcome to see how parents and students can transition. I'll be bawling my eyes out into this next phase of the I'll education I'll be with project. tissues right behind you. The balancing act starts right, right now. now. <laughs> we'll be like, no. Our Behind the Mystery series continues this morning with a look at a rare blood disorder, so rare in fact that it only affects a few patients per million. It's called PNH and here to help us unravel the mystery and tell us what that stands for and how to find it is Dr. Eloy Roman, a hematologist with extensive experience managing PNH, and Dan Chen Fung, a PNH patient advocate. Gentlemen, it's so great to have you both in the studio this morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank it's you. a very important topic. Thank you. For, Dr. I want to turn to you first and what exactly does PNH stand for and what is, is it exactly? Well, great question. PNH is a rare disorder. Uh, it stands for paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Wow. Okay, basically it's a disease of your immune system. Mm -hmm. Our immune system has various parts, specifically the complement system. Uh, we're learning more and more that the complement system has a lot to do with several illnesses and most of them are actually rare. Uh, the more time that passes, investigating these illnesses. PNH was one of these illnesses that we've we discovered. So the problem is that it is so rare, the median age is around the 35 years of age, mm. usually patients that you'd expect to be healthy. Mm. And uh, uh, the, every patient is unique. Patients come in with blood clots, some patients come in with renal failure, lung problems, every patient presents in their own way. And that leads, unfortunately, to delayed diagnosis. And of course, the more time that passes, the more illnesses these patients develop, the worse their kidneys are, the worse their body is. Their body is literally ravaged. Wow, the, I mean, this seems like a very serious illness. And what are the consequences that it has on the body? The immune system is all over our body. Mm -hmm. So it literally attacks our whole body. Uh, and there are several consequences, the worst of which are blood clots. This is a disorder that you have an immense risk of developing a blood clot. And that blood clot can be a stroke, a heart attack, you can clot off a leg, an intestine, and that could result in serious injury, morbidity, mortality. It can affect your lungs, your kidneys, you can go into renal failure, end in hemodialysis. So truly uh, a devastating disorder. And it, it tends to affect young people, even though it can affect young, the elderly, men, women. It does not discriminate based on race, age, gender. It's truly a global illness and it affects everyone. And the, the main problem is, number one, diagnosis. We're not thinking about this because it's rare. And number two, despite support, the best supportive care, for example, blood transfusions, blood thinners, all these steroids, everything we throw at this illness, especially in the past, simply did not work. Well, Dan, I want to turn to you. I mean, and tell me a little bit about yourself and what were your early symptoms? When I was 19, the fatigue, and like Dr. Roman referenced, you know, I, I went through that whole complement of, you know, blood transfusions, steroids, and it, just like it's a Band-Aid for a bullet wound. You kind of just are able to survive, and, but you are not able to thrive. Mm. You're just kind of existing, and you're waiting for your next health failure, and uh, you just kind of trudge on through. It was only about 11 years that I went through that before we were able to diagnose. So it took 11 years. That's just way too long. Doctor, I understand you see more PNH patients than most doctors out there. What are some of the other symptoms and, and what, are, what should people be aware of? What are the lab values test? I mean, this seems like it's hard to really pinpoint. It is. It's, it's a rare entity, so we're just not thinking about it. 
Uh, some things that, as, as Dan uh, mentioned, the, this disabling fatigue, difficulty with swallowing, blood clots, especially blood clots in unusual sites. You know, when these things happen, you have uh, abnormal blood counts that you simply cannot explain. If, if more people would do this and more physicians would think about it, the more patients would be diagnosed. Is there a simple test? Absolutely. It's a simple blood test. It's called flow cytometry, looking specifically for a protein on your red blood cells that is missing. If, that, if those proteins are missing, you have PNH. Such great information. So it's a simple test that doctors and patients need to be aware of. And there's so much more information we're going to talk about. So don't go anywhere. Stay right with us. We're coming back. We're back and I'm speaking with Dr. Eloy Roman and Dan Chen Fung about PNH, a rare blood disorder. And Dan, I want to turn to you again as a patient and an ambassador. Give me a little bit and tell me a little bit about your diagnostic journey and how you found out. When I was 19, you, I started to experience uh, chronic fatigue mm -hmm. and then you start to get into uh, hemolysis, like Dr. Uh, Roman referenced, the dark urine in the morning and uh, you, just, you just can't function normally. You, it's an overwhelming feeling. And it's hard to imagine that it took 11 years to diagnose you. And doctor, you know, turning to you, is, is this an awareness issue? Are not enough doctors and the general public aware of PNH? I believe this is a multifactorial issue. Mm -hmm. You know, there are many factors that take into play here. The, the, the most important one being we're just not aware. Mm -hmm. We don't think of this. You know, usually if, if we think of an illness, we're very likely to act on it, at least try to diagnose it. Right. Uh, as we mentioned previously, the diagnosis of this illness is quite easy. It's a simple blood test. All you got to do is have an arm and a needle. Right. That's it. And think of the test. The test is called flow cytometry. Okay. And the, the good news is that the test is getting more and more sensitive as time goes on. We talked before about it's not just an older generation, it's a younger generation, and men, women. What do people need to know if, they're, if there's someone out there feeling, you know, like they have some of these symptoms? What do they really need to know? Well, every patient's unique. Every patient presents their own way. A patient, for example, that comes in with an unexplained blood clot. Why is this person getting a blood clot in the liver, in the brain, in the leg? It shouldn't happen, so that's one. Especially a blood clot in an unusual site. Mm -hmm. uh, a person that comes in with unexplained, what we call in, in medicine, uh, cytopenias. Un uh, unexplainable anemia, low platelet counts, low white blood cell counts. You simply can't put a finger onto what's happening. That's right. another reason. So all these things together uh, should lead you to think of this possible entity. Not, not only all of them together, any one of those, because every patient's unique. Mm. And Dan, you know, there might be someone watching the show today that is feeling like you felt. What, what, would your, what would you say to that person? Initially, just open up a dialogue with your doctor about it. Uh, secondarily, I think there's a lot of information out there. Um, NORD, the National Organization of Rare Disorders, uh, has a wonderful website. There is a community out there of, of people who are, are, are surviving and thriving with the disease. Uh, the big thing for me is that they understand that although they, as they walk this path of PNH, that there are people there with them. The good news is that everything is getting better. Testing is getting better. Uh, more patients are being identified. Patients, once identified, hopefully they'll be placed in the PNH registry. So we learn more from them so that we may help others. And uh, not only that, the, the, the sources to get information from, pnhsource.com, there are other sources, pnhcommunity.org. There are many websites out there that can really assist patients so that, as Dan said, so that they don't feel alone, so that they know that we're in this together. That's great. It's actually great news. You know, there is a, there is a fast diagnosis. There's resources out there. Thank you both so much for coming in and sharing this. It's, it's an important topic, and there may be someone watching today that's right in the shoes you were in 11 years ago, Dan. Really, thank you both for coming in today. Thank you. And if you would like to know more, I want you to log on to thebalancingact.com. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well. We love hearing from you.
Transitioning your high school senior to college freshman is exciting and let's face it, a little scary. So we turn to the experts at the University of Oregon in the nation's top 2% of public universities for some tips on how to make the transition a success, no matter where you live. Because move-in day is just the first step. Watch this. Welcome to the University of Oregon. No matter where you call home or where your child will attend college, there are several important steps you, as a parent, can take to ensure student success once they get there. Orientation is critical to student success, their persistence, their ability to graduate on time. Uh, they have an opportunity to connect with other new students, with current students, with faculty, staff, and learn about what it takes to succeed both inside the classroom and outside the classroom. I was really nervous. I was nervous that I wasn't going to fit in or I wasn't going to find people that I connected with, like the people I connected with in high school. But once I got to orientation, all that just went right away. The orientation was great. I met a lot of new students that had similar interests as I did, so that was awesome. And the move-in, I had a lot of help from the campus and the students on campus, so it was fantastic. It was a great experience overall. In fact, I just unloaded the car on the sidewalk and the uh, kids helped um, move it all into the dorm room, which was great. Statistics show that the closer the student is to home, the less likely parents are to come to orientation. But attending is key to helping you and your freshmen feel more engaged. Anytime a parent is part of our activities, whether it's the orientation for new students, whether it's welcome week activities that we have both for students and for families, or if it's parent and family weekends that we have throughout the year, over the course of four years that a student's at the university, it really makes a connection not only for the parents, but it also tells your student that you are engaged, that you are invested in their success and their happiness, and that you support them being a student at a university. This week, Oregon um, put together the Week of Welcome, which has been extremely helpful for parents and families, especially that aren't from the Oregon area. Learning about financial resources is also a big part of bonding with your school. Everything we do at the University of Oregon is geared toward making a student successful. And that means we need to communicate effectively with students, with parents, with families. And financial concerns, not unsurprisingly, are always a big issue with families. And so the more information we can provide, the more we can lower the anxiety level from the very beginning. And it enables our students to concentrate on what they're really here to do, which is to take courses, earn their degree, plan for their future, and go off and be successful ducks. But when it comes to college affordability, the number one way to make college affordable is to make it four years instead of five. Because that fifth year adds tens of thousands of dollars beyond what a family may have planned for. Experts say it's also important for your student to meet with their professors and academic advisors at least once per quarter. At the end of the term, I meet with them to make sure I'm on track, uh, to see how my grades end up, and especially for me because I'm looking for graduate school. One of the things that we tell students when they come is to be successful in college, go to class, be prepared, and sit up front. Uh, because when you sit up front, you have the opportunity to engage with the professor. You're going to be more in tune to what's happening in the course, and you're going to get more out of the course. So coming into university, there are a lot of temptations, um, but making sure that the parents are engaged with their students, calling them here and there, um, talking to them, asking how their day went, is really exciting for the students to hear, and making sure that they're really disciplined with their academics, as well as getting involved on campus. Having parental involvement was very important, because without her, I honestly, I couldn't have done it. She was there for me for, from day one, and she helped me decide where I wanted to go. She helped me point me in the right direction, gave me some great advice, and without her, who knows where I would be. It's my first time being away for a long period of time, so it's gonna be a little difficult. They are nine hours um, ahead of me, so calling and communication, and things like that. It's gonna be a little difficult, um, but we'll make it work. I love them so much, and... <laughs> I thank them for everything they've done for me. Um, they've been great. They're the best parents I could ask for. Yeah, it was definitely hard because uh, I was living with my parents and uh, we're, uh, we're a really strong family and uh, we're very family valued. So uh, when I had to leave, it was like really hard for me. I, I was kind of homesick the first three weeks, four weeks of school. Well, this is it. Yep, yeah, I'll see you at Christmas. Hey, love you. Love you. Actually, we're gonna get to Salt Lake, okay? Okay. I will. Love you. Love you too. All right, study hard, okay? Have fun. 
Okay, not too much fun though. <laughs> not too much. Okay. Bye, bye. bye. There's a happy middle ground between staying too long and keeping your student from connecting with their, their new hallmates, their roommate, their peers, and, and then just leaving. Um, so we want there to be hugs, we want there to be a uh, moderate amount of tears and emotion, but it can be a tricky scenario, especially if it's the first, the only, or if a parent is going to be going back home to an empty house, that can be another transition. And so setting up that goodbye and talking about ahead of time, it can be very important. Preparing your student for college is a key step in preparing them for success later in life. The University of Oregon has many resources and tools on their website. You can also log on to our website for information. That's thebalancingact.com. And please visit us always on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks so much for spending part of your morning with us. What a beautiful Gorgeous. campus at the University of Oregon. And it's all about learning, and we hope you learned a little something this morning. Remember, we have lots more on our website. You can learn a lot there. Yes, That's thebalancingact.com. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. We want you to look us up. Until next time, remember to find your balance. So long, everybody.